All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Ridgway. We're going to do the next hangout for the introduction to astrophotography. Uh, this one's going to be about mounts. If you give me a minute, I'm going to uh, post the hangout in certain locations here, and then we'll get started. I've also uh, got an open uh, invitation to some of the people from uh, the Virtual Star Party. Yeah, that way, if they can make it in and, and talk a little bit about uh, uh, mounts and things with me, then that'll help tremendously. So, let's go. Just one second here. All right. Okay. Mounts. Uh, probably what you're going to hear, and uh, it's pretty good uh, advice, mounts for astrophotography is probably the most, it's not probably, it is the most important thing to your uh, setup. Uh, a good mount um, can mean, you know, everything when you're doing the, uh, when, you're, when you're taking any kind of uh, photographs. You could have a $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 telescope and have a $200 mount and you know you're going to get pictures that are worth you know not a lot <laughs> but uh you know in in the case of astrophotography the more you spend in in this case the better equipment you get uh, and the better off you're going to be now unfortunately not all of us have a lot of money to spend on a on just a mount um so we have to make do with what we got but um you know, you can do, as we've talked before, you can do astrophotography with, you know, just about everything. Uh, you just got to know what to expect. Uh, but for the people wanting to get into it, um, the first place that I would say now to look before you make any purchases at all is uh, look at the mounts first. Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, look um, at mounts first. You know, I jumped in and bought uh, my LX90, uh, which is a fork mount, and uh, we're going to... I've got some here that I'm going to share with you so I can uh, show everyone you know, exactly what we're talking about. And uh, so we're going to... Okay, and this is the uh, this is the telescope I use currently, and as you can see, it's, it's a fork mount. Um, you've got an arm on each side. This is also referred to as an altazimuth mount. Uh, you have basically two directions of movement, up and down, left and right. So you've got sideways and vertical, horizontal and vertical movement out of uh, this mount. So it's not as uh, it's not as accurate as uh, what an equatorial mount would be. Uh, it still works great. Uh, you know, I, I can get, uh, w with astrophotography, when you start taking your photographs, you're, you're going to want to try to take uh, lots, of, lots of photographs, but you're going to take longer exposures. And then normally when you take a picture, you take a, you know, a camera, whether it be a DSLR or anything, you just push a shutter button and it click, you're done. Uh, with astrophotography, you, 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 
you know, one single image could be anywhere from 15 seconds all the way to, you know, a couple hours. Uh, I'm not so sure that a lot of people are using a DSLR for a couple hours for one exposure, but uh, they could be, I guess. I usually get with the mount that you see on the screen here, I usually get around 30 to 45 seconds, and that's right out of the box. And that's pretty good when you're doing um, right out of the box um, and you're new to it. It's, it's actually pretty good for you know the money that I've got wrapped up in a, in a rig like this. Now, uh, what's the benefits to having this? Well, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> it, it's less complicated, actually. Uh, I, that's the biggest thing. Uh, when you get into equatorial mounts, you're going to have um, a lot of time in uh, polar aligning, uh, drift aligning, and doing those things will allow your accuracy to be, you know, a lot better uh, to take photographs with. With this telescope, you don't even have to point it up as you see. Uh, there's a little box on top of the fork that's a GPS receiver. You actually just point it, you know, directly level and aim the telescope north towards Polaris. Again, it's level, not pointed up. And then punch, punch a few keys on the keypad, it starts to align and you're done. It's pretty easy. However, again, your tracking is not as accurate with one of these mounts. Uh, let's turn off the screen share, sorry. So, w you know, with the with the alt azimuth, and you have many different kinds um, as well. Uh, I won't say many, but, uh, you know, there are a few. We'll go back over here and show you another photograph of a alt azimuth mount. The Dobsonian is... Um, it's a great telescope for beginners. Again, you have the vertical and horizontal movement of the mount. Um, you, we have a person in the uh, Virtual Star Party group that, that uses a Dobsonian to take fantastic pictures. In fact, he has to have taken one of my favorite pictures so far. He posted it tonight. Um, he made a equatorial platform for it, and it moves similar to an equatorial um, mount, uh, German equatorial mount. So, um, can you use the Dobsonian? Yes. It's probably not one of the best telescopes to use for, or mounts, let me say, for astrophotography, but you can use it. And, uh, yeah, Corey has shown us that uh, time and time again. So, it is possible. Now let's uh, turn the screen share off. So what's the best mount? You know, we have the alt azimuth and you have the fork, you have the Dobsonian. Uh, they also have the single arm mounts. I didn't get a picture of that. It's similar to a fork, only just half the fork. Um, Celestron makes a, uh, a, a telescope where it's just one side of the uh, scope has the arm. So the scope would be mounted here, and the arm's here, and your movement is like this. Um, so you have, you know, different types of alt azimuth. You, uh, then you've got the equatorial mounts. Um, the equatorial mounts are probably the best way to go for uh, any kind of astrophotography. Uh, the reason why is it the equatorial mount was was built to basically follow the movement or the rotation of the sky and how it does that we'll bring up a picture here of an equatorial mount so you guys can see this okay and this is an equatorial mount now if you see it's it's kind of angled upward. Uh, the telescope uh, would mount up at the top right hand corner. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys are seeing this the same way. If it's not, it'll be the top left hand corner for you. But at the top corner, that's where your telescope will mount. Your tripod will mount at the bottom of the photograph here. Um, and you can see that it's angled 
upward. Why? Well, it's angled upward, and basically where you would point this is at the North Star for those of us in the northern hemisphere that aren't upside down. Sorry, that's a long-running joke I've got. <laughs> um, theirs will be, uh, in the southern hemisphere, it'll be flipped over like this. <laughs> uh, just Again, it's just a joke. Um, but what you'll do is you'll point this at Polaris, okay? And then upon doing so, you will you will lock in the Polaris and you'll uh, you, um, start to do the uh, the polar alignment. And that's a I haven't done one yet, so I can't really explain in great detail how to do it. Uh, but what what that allows is um, if I can find a uh, let's bring this up. This is the same type of mount. Now this is a little bit better. This is one of the higher dollar mounts, so I don't want you to uh, think a whole lot about this. But you have, um, if you look, this is the bottom of the head here where the telescope will sit. The telescope will sit off to the side here. And it just rotates on different axes. Okay? And it'll follow the rotation of the Earth. So rather than just moving up or down, this will turn. Okay? And then the actual telescope will move. Now, this is a more accurate, like I said, because you're following that, you know, if you look up at the sky, you see the stars start in one place, you'll see them end in another place. Well, that's the, the rotation of, of the Earth causing that. And with this mount, it mimics that. It, it, it moves in that fashion. So it allows you to track much better, especially this mount that I'm showing here. Uh, you know, this is probably, again, one of the best mounts you can get. But we'll get more into that later. But this will allow you to track a lot better without getting into auto-guiding. Um, of course, the auto-guiding will help, you know, track forever, almost, I'd say. Um, but because you're moving with the rotation of the Earth, it, it you don't have those periodic... Uh, corrections in there for the up or the down. It's, it's a fluid movement while it's moving. Uh, I'm not really able to show video, but what I might do is post up a link to a video to show uh, a equatorial mount in motion. So you get an idea of how it works. But if, you, if you're getting started, the first thing you want to look at again, like I said, is a mount. Equatorial is probably the best way to go. Um, and oh, there we go. Mainly just because of the accuracy you're going to get, and uh, you really want accuracy. Sorry, I just got a message here. All right, make sure there's no questions here. Nothing so far that I can tell. Okay. So. You know, again, just uh, equatorial, and if you can, sw if you can swing that, uh, once you start getting in and, and building your your setup, uh, going to a website or a store and looking for specific components, you're going to start putting a little bit more money into it. Um, and you know, the you can go from one end to the other on on amount of money that you put into this. Uh, this setup and and just to give you a, a you know a little bit of an idea here we'll go in here and look for uh, for mounts and and give you an idea of what a good um, mount would be for you know telescope you're looking right now at a cheaper mount seven hundred dollars uh, the another company looks like they make one you got to look at how much that mount will hold to that's a big big thing. Um, your payload capacity, if you will, on your mount. Uh, what you got to re remember is when you start doing astrophotography, you don't just have the telescope on the mount. You're going to have a camera. Uh, you may have a filter. Uh, you may have um, 
you know, a, a smaller spotting scope so you can, you know, check where you are. Um, you can have a auto guider on there, which means you're going to have that second scope. You're going to have another camera mounted to that second scope. Uh, so you're going to have more stuff mounted to this. Now, uh, I'm looking at one right here that will hold a payload of 11 pounds, and they're $400 for one of these. Uh, the one for $700, you can do 35 pounds. And you think, oh, 35 pounds, am I really going to have that much? You'll be surprised once you get into this hobby. Um, and then from there, it just rises exponentially. Um, and a good mount that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the really good uh, photographers use is uh, eh, quite a bit of money. It's a CGE Pro mount, and it's a eh, upwards of four grand, five grand. So you're, but you're also looking at ninety pounds of capacity, and uh, you know it, it's a really good mount. So you know, again, you're looking at 300 to, you know, a few thousand dollars, and, and uh, it can get pretty salty if you do it that way, but uh, it, you know, probably will be worth it. I'm looking at a mount right now that's $84,000. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it weighs 2,000 pounds, and it'll have a payload capacity of 350 pounds, and that's made by Takahashi. Um, so you're getting into some really high dollar amounts. So anywhere from three hundred to eighty-three thousand dollars. I'm sure a lot of us won't need an eighty-three thousand dollar amount. A lot of us might not be able to afford an eighty-three thousand dollar amount. But there's your and and these are for uh, computer eye scopes, okay? Or mounts. I'm sorry. These aren't just plain hand guided. These have uh, you know a computer guiding uh, on them. So that's going to be a big, uh, big part of it too. You, you know, you're obviously going to want to computerize scope. Um, now you have another option, and this is the option that I have decided to take for now. Um, and I say for now because, believe me, you'll decide differently in the long run. I'm sure I will anyway. But if you really get into this, you'll start to decide differently. And let's screen share this photograph. This is a fork mount, as you can tell, but you can see it's sitting a little weird. And that's because right down here at the bottom, it's sitting on what we call an equatorial wedge. Now, this is to allow your fork mounted telescope to move in a fashion similar to an equatorial mount. This allows you to uh, move very similar, like I said, to the equatorial mount, so it'll, it'll allow your tracking to be more precise. Not as precise, but it'll help tremendously. And that's the way I've decided to go. I haven't quite got the equatorial plat or the wedge in yet. Once I do, I can, you know, give a full review on how well the wedge works. i got to learn how to do um, polar alignment and drift alignment first. So you're going to want to look in all your um, options here for, for what kind of mount you want. One thing I will say, with the fork mount, uh, you know, we're kind of backing it up a little bit here, but as I was looking at this photo, it reminded me of something. thought I'd throw it out there. With my fork mount, as it is right now, you can see that where we put the, t uh, the camera on the back of the telescope, okay? The one thing I learned is with this telescope, you want to put a couple of things on there. I've got a focal reducer. I have my T adapter, the T ring on the camera, then the camera. Um, now, with that, all that equipment on there, it actually hits the base of the mount. Now, I did find out that when it starts to hit, it stops it. It, it basically uh, wants to jump or 
Yeah, it's it's hard to explain, but it doesn't actually keep moving to where it'll break something. Uh, at least uh, when I tested it, it, it worked out pretty easy, pretty or pretty well. But it can mess up your gears inside of there for the movement of the scope. So you got to think about that too. You don't get a full, you cannot get a zenith shot with the DSLR attached to a fork-mounted telescope as it sits like this one is right here. Now, are there others out there where the forks sit a little higher and you've got more clearance? Possibly. I don't know. Um, I haven't seen one yet. It uh, doesn't mean they're not out there. I can tell you from experience, the one you see on the screen does not work. I'm limited to about 60 degrees um, you know, off of the horizon. Now, 60 degrees, that's a lot, but there's still another 30 degrees of objects up at zenith. That And, and the, the, the closer you get to zenith, uh, the better you know, your photos will start to look because you're, you're not going through as much of the atmosphere. So, at least that's the way I think it works. They don't, don't quote me on that 100%. <laughs> but, um, you know, the higher they are in the sky for us, the better your image quality will be. So, you know, with, it, with that being said, is a fork mount really the way to go? Well, if you use the wedge, with the wedge, I can go to zenith, okay? But there still may be a couple instances where it may crash into the mount. I don't know. I haven't used it yet. When I tried to build my own equatorial wedge, I noticed there might be a couple instances where that could happen. So just keep that in mind with a fork-mounted telescope. Um, now, you also have something like this. And that's basically a wedge, but it's custom or it's it's made from the from the factory like this. I guess it's a it's a pier that's set at a specific angle, and that get, that'll give you basically an equatorial wedge for a fork mounted telescope. Um, and I'm sure that it'll have to be custom made for your location. Um, because at each location the uh, the north celestial pole is going to be at a different uh, altitude than you know someone somewhere else so it'll have to be custom made I'm sure um, so there is that as well but as far as like I said as far as the mount goes your, your best bet's really going to be a German equatorial and it's going to be for that reason of, of movement and um, accuracy from there, uh, the sky's the limit um, on cost. Uh, you know, the, obviously the most cost-effective way is to be able to buy the whole rig custom, or pre-built and, and ready to go. You can do that. Um, I mean, a lot of those still get pretty expensive, but uh, you, you can do that. Um, but, again, when you, when you want to look into it, uh, Start with your mount. If you, if you really want to get serious about your um, astrophotography, you know, start with your mount. If you know if it's not a huge deal for you, if you're going to do double duty 50/50, uh, you know, you don't have to worry so much about it. Equatorial mount's still going to be better for you, but it's not a necessity if you're doing 50/50. It's not a necessity either way you go. I do all of my images with a fork mount. 30, 45 second images. I'm pretty happy with them. I know I can do better. I will upgrade eventually to an equatorial mount, I'm sure. But for now, I'm happy. Um, I'm not sure if there's really any questions out there at all. Yeah. James Haney says, "No wonder you get such great shots." Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't get that good of shots, but uh, it looks like we got uh, somebody joined us here. Yeah, we got the upside down astronomer Paul Stewart joined us from New Zealand. Hello, Paul. Hey, gang. Well, we were just went going over some of the different mount types, and uh, you know, I spoke briefly about. Uh, 
basically the two major ones, the alt azimuth and the equatorial mount. And, you know, that the equatorial mount is probably one of the best bets for astrophotography. Wouldn't you agree with that, probably? Just trying to figure out why I haven't got a picture, and we'll be back with you in a minute. Okay. Well, you've got a picture. It's of your scope, which is a fantastic image. While he's got that up, while he's uh, trying to figure out why he doesn't have video here, Paul is basically has got a scope very similar to mine. His is obviously bigger, a lot nicer, but he's a he's got a fork mounted telescope and he's using his if you notice on a wedge. And he gets some fantastic images out of it. Of course, I know, you know, a little bit more of uh you know, some problems that you can have with this and uh you know he may want to eventually upgrade to a equatorial mount eventually. Oh, somebody's excited that you're in here, I guess. <laughs> okay. But so you see that you know, a lot of us use the, the fork mount and that's I'm not real sure. It's probably just cost effectiveness. I, you know, I, I know that's why I bought mine was the the cost aspect of the of the fork mount. And you can buy a fork mount and buy a wedge for it. Oh, Paul left the group. He's having a little bit of trouble with his uh, camera. But you can you can just buy a fork mount and buy an equatorial wedge for it. Uh, keep in mind, I noticed something with mine. Again, I have the Mead LX90. I'm, I'm not so sure they make the original Mead wedge for it. They make other wedges now for the fork mounted telescopes. But I'm not sure if they make the LX90 mount the original one. And it was a $200 mount. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to pick one up used, um, but a lot of the websites that I went to were out of them, and Mead, the Mead store itself, was out of them. So, you know, keep that in mind. And the new equatorial wedges that they sell have went up a lot in price. Uh, the last I checked, one was. Um, Four ninety nine, and then they went up a little bit more from there. And I know Paul uses a wedge from another company, and they are a little bit more expensive. But he was very happy with the wedge and the quality of the wedge, and how much better it was, in his opinion. So y you do still have some uh, options there for you if you decide to go with something like I have with the LX ninety. Uh, the LX200, I'm pretty sure they're pretty easy to find the wedges for. Excuse me. Um, so, German Equatorial, fork mount, wedge mounted fork mount. It, it, you know, it's, it's just out there. So, uh, I always say, you know, you your best bet is to to kind of look around if you, if you can get to a star party um, and walk around look at the scopes you see talk to the people that own them uh, find out you know why they picked the scope that they did again I picked the scope I did the fork mount for uh, the price and the fact that uh, I do know that a lot of the Schmidt Cassegrain uh, telescopes have um, coma problems, okay? But I picked mine up because it has a um, special mirror lens setup. It's called, you know, an ACF. It's advanced coma free. So they did a little bit work, a little bit of work to it, and uh, helped to remove that coma. Um, so I picked it up for a couple of reasons. The price was great, and the the design I really liked. Um, and if you do that, you do still have options. Uh, Mead, Mead does make these single arm telescopes as well. You can use any of them for astrophotography. Keep that in mind. You can, if it has a 
well, even if it has a one and a quarter inch uh, eyepiece, you can still use a DSLR. I have a T adapter for one and a quarter uh, eyepiece adapter and a two inch. So I can use my DSLR on pretty much any telescope other than a uh, store, a cheap store bought uh, knockoff. They use a point nine six five eyepiece holder. And they're, uh, obviously, they're not as well built. So, uh, try to see if Paul might join up here and we'll get, if he does, we'll get his insight into uh, what he thinks of, of the different uh, the different mounts. I'm not so sure if he'll be able to join up or not. He's having a little problems. Um, the German Equatorial, just to kind of go over everything until we see if Paul can jump back in. German Equatorial, you're looking at, uh, yeah, here he is. The uh, the fact that it'll move. I got you there now, Paul. This time. Yep. Perfect. So, uh, you know, like I said, I was just kind of going over things real fast. The, the German Equatorial moves with the rotation of the Earth, the, the, the movement of the sky is as we see it. Uh, the fork mount is up and down, left and right. You mount it on a wedge, it, it moves similar to a, a German Equatorial. Uh, so you go either way. Uh, like I said, I've chose to go with a fork mount on an Equatorial wedge. Paul uses the same thing. Um, you know, we get pretty good results, uh, but I'm sure you'll probably, there. one of the mounts that I showed you, uh, uh, one of our people in the Virtual Star Party uh, runs one of those, and he can get, I think he said 30-minute subs without auto-guiding. Now, if that's the case, that's just phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> without any kind of auto-guiding equipment. Um, Paul, I mean, you know, I, I'm, kind of went over everything really. I mean, as far as the mounts, I, I, I basically brought up the equatorial and then the fork mounts, um, which is alt azimuth, and then the fact that with the fork mounts you can get a wedge for those. You know, in, in your opinion, would you would you say the equatorial, if you're really getting serious in astrophotography, is the way to go probably? Oh, most likely, but um, I think there's a lot you can do with a standard old as on a wedge, mm -hmm. which we can show you because the scope is not currently mounted on the wedge. Oh, okay. <laughs> It'll be a bit be dark. Perfect. Yeah, I'd still get a pretty good look at it though. If the cord was long enough. <laughs> Where the, um, just so everybody is aware, where you have the two white marks, that's where your scope would be mounted to, correct? Yes, it would normally be there. Okay. Then you have a big handle, which you probably can't see, for adjusting it and right ascension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And around the back, which you won't be able to see, is the declination adjustment. Mm hmm. And the whole trick is to get the line through the center pointing straight at the celestial pole. Right. Which is not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, exactly. And that was one of the things that I brought up about uh, e uh, either an equatorial uh, mount or an equatorial wedge is that you then start to get, get into uh, polar aligning and or... Uh, drift aligning and it's it can be tricky and difficult uh, so you know you got to think about that like I said with my mount uh, with the GPS receiver and everything I don't even point it at the North Star I just point it in north and at the telescope's level and it does its thing and I don't even have to mess with doing really any alignment I center a star in the eyepiece and say go and it's done so very, very simple. That was another reason why I picked it, because I'm lazy, and I don't like to do a whole lot of work. <laughs> As you can see, I'm so lazy, I can't even remember how to shave. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, as Paul said, 
he uses the equatorial wedge. I use, I, I've got an equatorial wedge coming in for my uh, LX90, and you can get some really good images. Paul, what's some of the uh, longer uh, images that you've been able to get with your setup on an equatorial wedge? Oh, I'm limited to about 10 minutes due to sky oh. glow and that sort of rubbish. Okay, so so 10 minutes, that, and that's really a, a quite a long image. I, and just to kind of touch base with that, back to where we were earlier um, for everybody, that is one single image, is 10 minutes. And normally with mine, I get about 30 seconds. So that, that gives you an idea of, and Paul does uh, auto guiding, uh, so that helps him uh, quite a bit. Um, and he could go longer if it wasn't for, as he said, sky glow and light pollution and all the other crap that he has to contend with. So, um, yeah, you you know you can go either way, and, and don't let the the fact that I said a, a German equatorial mount is, you know, that's what they're made for, is for the movement. Uh, but don't let that deter you from buying a fork mount. If you if you want a fork mount, you want to spend, uh, you know, if you're watching your budget, uh, you can go fork mount and equatorial wedge, and it will work just as just as good, I think, uh, in in some cases. Uh, so, if not better. Yeah, yeah, depending on, you know, many different things, I'm sure. Yep. You don't have the annoying meridian flip to worry about, as you do with an equatorial mount. Oh, yeah. And I didn't think about that either. <laughs> and I, I, I showed everybody earlier, you weren't in here, you wasn't able to see it, so I'll, I'll bring it up so that you can see it. Uh, but I posted a photograph for everybody to see. Um, of an equatorial mount uh, that shows up, doesn't it? Yep. And you know, I showed him that that it's it's pointed at the celestial pole, and for this one, it's pointed to Polaris. And then if we do this, it's for you Southern Hemisphere folks. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to do that while I was in there. <laughs> but, uh, and like we said, uh, and the other photograph that I showed was, uh, or uh, that's not it, this one right here. And we'll, we'll show this one real quick. And this kind of shows how it moves. Now, this is uh, right ascension. This was as the telescope has moved in its right ascension. It's also moved in the, uh, no, it hasn't moved in the declination. The declination would be right here in this black box, basically. Uh, but the, the right ascension will be this long bar here, if you will. And that'll, that'll turn. And then the, it, it, it's difficult to, uh, to tell you about it. It's easier to see it. <laughs> it's, it's funny. When I got my first equatorial mount telescope, which was all hand-guided, and I started to move it, I thought, wow, this is really funny to use. <laughs> so it, it can be um, difficult to use in, in some cases. Um, but don't let that deter you from doing it. It's, it just takes some time to learn how to polar align. And then with the... Uh, astrophotography, drift aligning, uh, you know, maybe eventually sometime with one of these hangouts we can get into what those things are. I'm not really sure 100 percent, but I'm going to have to figure it out soon. Um, do you have uh, any um, anything really to add on, on, on mounts and, and how important it is or unimportant or well, at the moment, my mount is sitting on the floor in pieces. Oh. I'll show you the guts of it. Somehow. Yeah, got a pretty good look at it, really. Yeah. It's got various electronic -y bits in there. So we go in here. We've got the right ascension drive, which mm -hmm. is this bit here. And there's a big right ascension gear with the worm block in there. 
And here's the other one. It's a declination worm block. So it's just a geared motor. Yep. Driving a worm gear. Which then goes on to a bigger gear. Which drives the declination axis. It's not really a position a scope normally sits in. <laughs> no, that's not one we like to see him sit in either, is it? <laughs> that gives you an idea what's going on inside it. And again, this is for the uh, for the fork mounted. The German Equatorial are going to be similar, uh, but things are going to be in different places, and it'll be set up a little different but pretty similar on the how it's going to work. Yeah, same, same gears and worms and all that. So we're just tinkering with that at the moment, just trying to get the drives to go a little bit smoother. There's a bit of play in there. Mm. And I, be too hard to figure out. I told everybody that, you know, one of the most important things for astrophotography is the mount. The mount, the mount, the mount. Uh, you know, they hear they're going to hear that when they go and do research. If they do for uh, buying their gear, um, you know, and like you said, you, you can use a fork mount and a wedge, but even a cheap fork mount versus, say, the fork mount that you use or the fork mount that I use may not be as good still. So, um, yeah, I mean, would you? You know, you could, uh, I, and I kind of gave an example of you can have a, you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollar scope and a two hundred dollar mount, and you're not, you're not going to get that great of quality pictures if the mount doesn't work right. And, uh, you know, you think that pretty much well uh, explains yep. that pretty good. Yeah, if your mount doesn't track right, you won't get nice crisp stars, and it'll just be a mess. Yeah, yeah, you'll see them uh, uh, actually streak. You'll see just a long line across the screen of, of your stars, and and that's from from the lack of good tracking. Uh, so it's it's uh, you know it is all about the mount. Your your optics play a huge part as well, but without that good mount, your good optics won't really help you at all. So you know you gotta you gotta really focus on the mount. The mount should have been probably the first hangout that I did, but I thought it would be a later hangout. It's not going to be as long. Um, I'm not sure even how long I've gone so far, but I've covered a lot of it already. Really, um, like I said, you can yeah, on a German Equatorial, you can go anywhere from 300 to. $83,000 on that one website. As far as fork mounts go though, I'm not so sure. Can you uh, can you buy like a fork mount separately? Because I'm not so sure that I've ever seen one. Some of the top end ones you can with uh, 50, 60 grand worth. Mm. And uh, we've got a comment here from, uh, hopefully I don't just slaughter this guy's name, uh, Juka Lakeso. Lakeso. Um, he said, many EQ mounts have software-assisted polar align procedures, so it's not that hard to do that polar aligning these days. Celestron, ASA, and Skywatcher at least has that uh, SW-assisted align. So there's something else to kind of, maybe help you all feel better <laughs> is uh, you know I'm not sure if my LX90 has that feature um, probably not it's probably going to take a little bit more for me but it's a fork mounted so it probably doesn't so you do have that option of uh, getting one with the uh, polar aligned assist uh, which will help I'm sure because uh, it can be a bear so uh, you know, I, I'm really, really not too sure where else to go with this, but you know, it's all about uh, you know, just you want to have a good base for anything uh, that you that you're setting someone, and especially with you know optics that cost as much as a telescope, you want to have that good, solid, sturdy base. And with when you're doing movement and taking a long exposure, you want that movement to be as precise as you possibly can. You can go down and break down the line and say some of the mounts, but 
without, I don't know whether I'd get in trouble with really throwing out a bunch of names there, but, uh, you know, Orion, Celestron, and Mead make some great mounts. And then you can get all the way up, like I said, the Takahashi that costs almost $100,000 for a mount. You know, it's a 3,000-pound mount that will hold 350 pounds or whatever it said it would. That's a pretty hefty mount, but that's probably in a professional big big deal observatory like at a university or somewhere maybe I'd say. Um, so you can, you can do that. And as Paul said, you could probably get a, um, a fork mount. Uh, but most of your fork mounts are going to be uh, higher end too. So your fork mounts, a lot of them you're going to find your telescopes already set up, uh, like the LX200 Mead and the LX90 that we use. Great scopes, and the the mounts are really good as well. Uh, they just don't have that that angle to them for the polar aligning. So uh, really, I'd, I'd say that's about all I got. I mean, unless you got a, a whole lot more. Paul or anything else to add to it, uh, you know, feel free. Well, I think you've covered most things. The only um, point about the old hairs or the meads is you really need to balance them quite well by putting a big chunk of something underneath them. If they're out of balance, the gears will just wear out in no time at all. So there's almost 5 kgs of weight just to balance the accessories that are on my scope at the moment. Hmm. Something I didn't think about before my wedge comes in. Hopefully I won't need a whole lot of weight to balance mine out. I'm not using a whole lot of uh, anything really. Um, that's, a, that's a good point. And of course with your, uh, with your German equatorial mounts you've got weights on there. So that's basically kind of what Paul's talking about. It, it, you know, you're going to set it up just like a German equatorial mount. You're going to put weights down there and try to balance everything. Now I'm sure that'll only balance what the uh, from the scope. Would you mount that like at the bottom, underneath the scope, like the uh, like the hangs, German equatorial yeah. would be? Hangs under your tube, so you want your tube balanced to wherever it's pointing. It should just sit there. With the clutch is released, your scope should just sit in any position you put it, and shouldn't move at all if it's properly balanced. Well, that's good. I, it looks like I'm probably going to have to talk to you when I get mine in. <laughs> Play with it some more. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, there you go. If you if you go that route, think about that, too. Um, because, like I said, when you have your telescope, you don't just use an eyepiece. You're going to add a little bit of weight if you do it like I do and just use a DSLR. Uh, it's not a lot. It may not cause a lot of problems for me. But with Paul's setup, he's got, you know, um, all kinds of extras added to his scope. He's got his solar scope added to there. Um, and he uses an off-axis guider, which adds some more weight if he has filters and cameras and everything else. So it, it will throw the balance off quite a bit. And then, as he said, it'll just mess up your warm gears. And then you'll just have more money to spend on stuff that you shouldn't have spent it on. So keep that in mind, and, and obviously once you get into something like that, you're going to be doing some research anyway, at least I hope you will, and, and you can find out more information. Um, so if there's any questions, you know, feel free to post them uh, anywhere on the, uh, the, hang, or the, yeah, the Hangout uh, post that I've, that I've got up there, uh, you know, or or you can just post questions to me specifically if you want, or and if I don't know it, I can sure ask any one of the guys from the uh, uh, virtual star party that may be able to help me as well for any of your questions that you might have. It, do do a lot of research, regardless of what you do. Do a lot of research uh, before you jump into. Uh, a whole lot of money for your scope, um, but if you want to save some money, uh, you know, like I did, you can do the fork mount, um, and you can still get beautiful images with it. Uh, I I get 30 to 45 seconds, and you add a bunch of those together, and it's like getting an hour or two hour image out of it. 
So, you know, use that to your advantage or disadvantage, however you want to look at it. And uh, hopefully, uh, this will help you with uh, being able to choose your purchase. And uh, like I said, your your first your first look should be um, amount if if you want to get really serious. And, and uh, you don't want to use the fork mount. Look real, look real hard into the mounts online and uh, see what all there is out there to, for you to pick up. But I think we'll end there. It's been a pretty quick hangout, just shy of an hour. So the others have went over an hour, two hours almost. But Paul, thanks for jumping in there uh, for a few minutes and giving your input on uh, how you uh, on the on mounts and everything, showing us your broke mount or tore apart mount anyway. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. Not a problem. And hopefully uh, your head don't hurt for too long, being having to stand on your head, and so we can see you right side up here. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. Well, have a good night, and we'll say thanks again to Paul Stewart, and thanks for watching. And uh, any more questions or anything, just feel free to post, and we'll see if we can get them answered for you. Uh, we're gonna do another mount or another uh, hang. I'm gonna do another hangout. I'm not sure what yet. Um, maybe cameras. Uh, maybe uh, probably cameras. Um, I'm not going to do a, a whole lot more. Probably cameras and maybe we'll go into some of the software that we use for uh, astrophotography. Uh, your stacking software um, and then some of the uh, processing software that we use. Um, and you know there's not a lot but there is quite a bit out there that you'll have to choose from so uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably get into software eventually and then maybe I'll, I'll do a hangout for a beginners um, image processing for astrophotography I'm still a beginner well, I mean we're, we can all still be considered beginners we learn something new every day um, but I don't know quite as much about my processing as say Paul does or some of the other guys uh, so I can kind of show people how to do uh, basic very extremely basic image processing techniques that'll help you out and you know that'll probably be the end of this maybe two or three more uh, hangouts for this and and you know we'll be all done so thanks again and don't forget tomorrow night uh, don't remember what time the uh, don't I don't remember what time it starts. Hopefully, I'll be able to be in on the uh, virtual start party. It's tomorrow night. It's saying uh, 10 p.m. my time, I think. So that'll be uh, 7 p.m. Um, Pacific time, I think. So uh, this is 10 p.m. Eastern time is when the virtual start party will start tomorrow. And then, you know, don't forget also about the looks like they've got learning spaces coming up in a couple of days uh, the weekly space hangout with Fraser and Pamela uh, also no we missed that one didn't we the Friday February 20 yep we missed the hangout but uh, we've got you know don't forget about the weekly space hangouts and uh, Pamela and CosmoQuest has a learning space coming up next Wednesday and tomorrow's a virtual star party I'm pretty sure so don't forget about all those. So everybody have a good night. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you, Paul. Thanks. See you later.